welcome our guest esteemed mr christopher glaser ceo of telex and board member of the international art of living nice to see you wonderful it's a real a real pleasure um such a beautiful incredibly beautiful campus and as i arrived yesterday uh, i could feel the vibes the good vibes of the campus and uh, i think i would have been very happy to be able to start in such a wonderful university as this is uh, so achita has been saying i've been lecturing at harvard business school at yale at other universities but this is great this is great now um you know uh, with the vision of good uh, fisher uh, vishankar we have established the tilex institute um tilex stands for transformational leadership for excellence and i'm the ceo um and um as you can see here we have um globally 200 people working for the organization we have offices around the world um and um we have worked with some of the um uh, most outstanding organizations from google to apple to uh, deutsche telekom uh to the world bank uh we have also had the pleasure to um train the swiss national tennis team any sports fans here anybody into sports you know roger federer oh roger federer so i grew up actually in the village of roger federer uh, just 150 meters from him and um at the end of this session i would like to share with you what i think was his biggest asset to become as big as he has been and i think it was more in the mind and even a little bit less in his hands and legs now um i had a pleasure to attend the world economic forum in davos you have heard about the world economic forum once in a year uh typically in january uh, the global leaders meet in switzerland in davos uh, honorable prime minister modi goes there regularly and actually india represents one of the largest delegations uh typically at the world economic forum 80 heads of states um the biggest ceos and you know the common talking is that um the world has never changed as fast as it has is doing right now and yes we can make the point um in 1920 the average lifetime of a company lifespan of a company was 67 years how long do you think is the average lifespan of a company today more or less more how many say more how many say less it was 67 years 100 100 years ago today it's just 15 years companies are going and coming how many of you had a nokia phone when you grew up how many of you have a nokia phone now nobody ha huh? oh you have one big round of applause <laughs> you know i was invited to speak at nokia um to the global ceos back in 2007 and at that time when i was telling my family that i will speak in helsinki to the global ceos of nokia they basically bowed down say this is christoph you are going to the heart of the business um and i remember i gave my speech and i came back they gave me a, a mobile phone as a gift it was like a sandwich that fat yeah. remember the sandwich <laughs> huh happy and when i went back showing my sandwich my father said wow christoph now now i'm happy with you <laughs> around at the same time one mr steve jobs you have heard the name he called at nokia in finland and he said i have an idea i think we need to change the mobile phones we need the smartphones you know what was the answer we don't have time who are you mr jobs we are the number one they were very fast in execution of their idea but i think they were lacking one very important ingredient which is needed in the wuka world and i want to talk with you about that ingredient because would you agree when everything is changing so fast and when there are so many people in the world stress and fear can come into us there's two common fears i think which we humans have one is will i get what i need Have you caught yourself thinking like that? Will I have the money that I need, the health that I need, the job that I need? 
And number two, can I keep what I have? My boyfriend, girlfriend, my health, my possessions, my position. But when fear is driving us to run, we are lacking that spark of innovation. So yes, the world has never changed as fast as today. I think the, fa the statement could be fair. Have a look at this. Um, what do you see here? What does that tell you? Yeah? What comes to your mind? Huh? Yeah? We are modernizing fast, yes. We are talking about being in the fourth industrial revolution. What did, what did the first industrial re revolution bring to us? Huh? Huh? First industrial revolution? We are talking about leadership 4.0. First industrial revolution, a couple of hundred years ago. Yes, it was a big, big thing to happen. Yeah, engines. Right? Remember Mahatma Gandhi? Showing, showing the India and the world that, 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 that huh? Yeah, that, that we are getting into that indus industrialization. What was the second, the second uh, uh, um, uh, industrial revolution? Huh? The light. The light, very, very important. Imagine a world without light. And you know, those countries who excelled in these dimensions, they conquered the world. How could a small country as UK come to India? We might think, right? Of course they have left. It's good. They were ahead at that time. What, is the, what was the third industrial uh, revolution? The the now we are talking, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is boring stuff. Yes, the internet. And what is the fourth industrial revolution? Now that we are in? Now we are in this time where A, everything is so fast. And number two, yes. Right? Our human nature and the artificial intelligence, more and more we become one. See, in the last two years, 90% of all data that was ever produced has been produced. And maybe we could also argue, I'm going to walk a lot, uh, forth and back to my presentation, maybe the world will never change as slow as it is today. It is believed in another 10 years, 50% of today's jobs will not exist anymore. 50% of today's companies will not exist those who are not able to innovate and transform, who stay the Nokias. And as Rajita was saying, I think it's not a surprise that we are all running therefore, right? We are in a hurry. So what does VUCA stand for? Leadership in the VUCA world. What does VUCA stand for? Huh? V vulnerability? So now we know why not so many people came. We didn't understand the title, yeah? What is VUCA? Huh? Uncertainty, right? Complexity, yes. Yes, exactly. Volatility, yeah? Everything is volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Yes, very good, great, super. You know, sometimes I feel this is like a summary of my life. <laughs> yeah. So we can say, if that's the case, obviously, we need to be fast, right? You know, as Rajita was saying, it's, it's, a, it's a pure, I don't know how it all happened. I had the pleasure to travel a little bit more than 70 countries and deliver programs. I, I was a small, I mean, I, for me, in Switzerland, I come from Switzerland, going over the border to Germany always felt like a challenge. But my first program I ever taught was actually in the Saudi Arabia. I was invited by the royal family about 23 years ago. And I had a chance to really meet many head of state, CEOs, <coughs> leaders, but also um, people in the slums of Kenya. And I think what I have seen is that 
it is beautiful if we can combine speed with a certain inner stability. Would you agree? Like it, have you observed that sometimes when we are very fast, we are also restless? Have you had this experience? And when we are very calm, we are tired. <laughs> but the balance is important. Then we are in the flow. And McKinsey did a research which has been showing that when we are in the flow, they did a 10-year research, and they wanted to know when are we most innovative. And they found when we are in the flow, we are five times more productive and innovative. One of the most innovative minds on this planet, probably Einstein. I think we would all have loved to learn from him, right? And he is quoted to having said that, unfortunately, he said, I never had the good ideas at work. It's basically nothing happened at work. Do you know that experience? <laughs> You're sitting in front of your book and your mind is empty. <laughs> How many of us know it? I'm not the only one, right? He said, my good ideas, they come when I'm under the shower when I'm going for a walk. Have you had this experience? Quite unreliably, suddenly an idea comes. So, how can we manage our mind is vitally important. So, this balance between speed and inner stability, I think, brings that flexibility which makes us agile. Are you talking in India about agile? In, in many parts of the world, the whole business is about being agile. And it describes exactly this ability to run and to become, to be innovative. At this year's World Economic Forum, it was interesting. Last year, actually, I attended with Gurudev. Uh, it was an amazing time. Um, I met so many heads of state, CEOs, just spending basically one week with him pretty much alone in that camp, in that, in these meetings. This year, a big change to last year, 80% of the discussions were on artificial intelligence. I want to show, you know, I like uh, cartoons, and I want to show uh, you a cartoon. Have a look at this one. So here you have the boss, right? And so this gentleman, he would like to get a promotion. And the, the robot also would like to get a promotion. So the, rob, the, 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 the boss says to the leader here, I would like to give you the promotion. Technically, you're very sound. Unfortunately, the robot shows more empathy, shows more heart. What I see in the world is that, you know, when I talk to senior leaders in coaching, they're typically very proud to tell me, today I was in 12 meetings, I didn't even use the bathroom, and I had no lunch. Back-to-back -back meetings. But if you think of it from another angle, we are trying to out-robot robots. Can we, can we be successful? Can we be a better robot than a robot? I think in future, and this, a lot of research shows that in future, to be relevant on this market, this global marketplace, human touch is needed. Human touch. In a world that is scary. Right? With whom would you like to work? A robot or somebody who actually cares for you beyond... Um, just your technical skills. Now, for that, we need resilience. Uh, are we talking about resilience on this campus? What is resilience? What is resilience, would you say? Inner calmness, Inner calmness yeah? Stability. Stability, yeah? Um, it's a new buzzword, right? So resilience describes your ability to bounce back when you're thrown out of balance. Yeah, bouncing back. How many of you have felt, at least once in your lifetime, emotionally really down? How many of you? Yeah. Do you remember a situation where maybe you felt 
this bad feeling will never go away. Yeah? It's, it's there, it's our experience, right? You know? How do we deal with it? Yeah? You know, I remember, so in our culture, we, we don't necessarily get married, right? So we, we can have a girlfriend. So when I was about, oh, whatever, 22 or so, I had my first girlfriend. I was very happy. And after half a year, I thought, this, this is running really good. So she called me for a Sunday brunch. I drove with my bicycle. And then after half an hour, she explained to me that I'm no good. <laughs> to be with me is really not a fun. And she would like to break up. You know, when I drove back on my bicycle, I still remember I felt like I'm dead. And I remember that I thought this feeling will no, never go away. I will never ever feel good again. I was clear about it. It was so painful. I went to my best friend, we spoke. The point is, a couple of weeks I was almost amazed that this feeling was not there anymore. It, 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 I realized it's going away. Did you have such experience? And that's, I think, an important one, to not be afraid of our emotions. You know, today, science would show that emotional intelligence is more important, the way we manage our emotions and we relate to others, than our intelligence. Yeah? You know, in, we measure intelligence quotient. And I, by chance, had a quite a high one. My mother was very happy. But today we know 90% of the top performers are high in emotional intelligence. And many people with a low intelligence can outperform people with a high intelligence if they can manage themselves and people. And that is what resilience really is. You know, there is also a word which says, what, what, doesn't, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Do you say that in India? Or is that a Swiss thing? <laughs> and there is research which supports that. During Corona, they did research, and they found that when people had to change five things at work, five things, they were 13 times more resilient. So instead of being live with people, you're on the screen. You also had that, right? You had to stay at home, etc. But then again, sometimes it is too much. And then we feel stressed. This is the very famous Johnson, uh, Dotson Jerks curve. You have seen it? The word stress comes up in the literature, literature about 100 years ago. And we need a little bit of pressure and stress to be good. Do you need an exam sometimes to learn? How many of us need an exam to learn sometimes? <laughs> yeah. But then sometimes when we perceive something to be too difficult, exactly in the moments when we think, now I need that job, and I make myself so much pressure, we are no more good. How many of us experienced that, that in a moment when you felt, I really need to win, you couldn't? It's there, no? So that's a very interesting phenomenon. And today, just to say that, stress is a huge one. This is <laughs> something quite amazing. It's called the Global Negativity Index. We should have the Global Happiness Index. And you can see more and more people feel highly stressed. More and more people. About 50% of the people, when you ask them, did you have high stress yesterday, they will say yes. But how can we build resilience? What is your experience? How can we build resilience? What are the most important factors to stand up again when you fall? When you are told you are no good <laughs> and you are driving on your bicycle. What do you need? Huh? Patience, yeah. Yeah? Count on ourselves. Yeah, what else? Huh? Motivation, yes. Determination. By practicing mindfulness and relaxation techniques. Ah, practicing mindfulness and relaxation. Absolutely. Very good. How many of you are doing it? Mindfulness? Wow. Breathing? You have to, huh? <laughs> if only I would have learned it at that time. Yes? Huh? Mindset. Very true. 
So in a minute, I'm going to share with you an assessment and you can assess your resilience. Would that be interesting? Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to share with you the concept. So scientists would today say there's four key elements to resilience. The first one is the ma our mental state. Our ability to be present. How present are you now? I can see your body, but where is your mind? Huh? How many would, you, would say, my mind is here 100%? <laughs> Not sure, right? <laughs> okay, wow. How many would say 80%? How many didn't hear the question because you were riding on a mobile? <laughs> huh? Being present. Being present is number one factor for happiness and performance. And then mindset, as you said, so important. You miss your bus for a meeting, you are with two friends. One will say, the world is against me, always against me. The other one will say, oh, we'll get the next bus. <laughs> Same bus has left. What is the story? The stories we tell to ourselves. So we don't need soap opera if we watch our stories, right? And then a very important one is that sense of future. If you don't have that, work out a dream for yourself. It gives energy. A big dream helps us to come over the smaller obstacles. And then the second one would be about um, the physical dimension. A healthy body. You know, there's a saying, sitting is the new smoking. How many hours a day are you sitting? Huh? Seven? Nine hours, yeah? Anybody more? <laughs> you know, research shows ten. If we sit more, the average German, by the way, in your age, sits ten and a half hours. But if we sit more than six hours, the risk of heart disease goes up by about 150 degrees. People die almost 10 years er, uh, earlier when they sit too much. So you need to move your body. We need to move our body. And then the second piece here is wealth. How many of us would like to be rich? Yeah? Ah! Now everybody's participating. Yeah. You know, th there is a Princeton US study which was asking the question, it, does money make us happy? What do you think it found? Yes. <laughs> we are very clear on this point, right? <laughs> we are very clear on this point. Yeah. So yes, they found yes, but. This is also a summary of life. Yes, but. They found happiness goes up to an average income of 75,000 uh, annually at that time in, in US. 75,000 US dollars annually a couple of years ago. But then it remained stagnant. Nothing happens afterwards. Afterwards, they say it's about my ability to be grateful. It's a mental aspect. And it's true, you know, I, I, as I said, I was in Saudi Arabia staying with one of the most important princes, the governor of Mecca and Jeddah. Um, in his palace, I trained his whole family. And he used to tell me that most of the princes suffer from depression, alcoholism, etc and a lot of jealousy amongst each other. How many of us have been jealous in your life? How many? They are jealous because some, I have two billion, the other person has three billion. And we can be jealous for 200 rupees and 300 rupees. The feeling inside is jealousy. So that's an important one, managing our own complexity then the third one here is the social dimension, having friends. How many of us feel I have one friend with whom I can share everything? Yeah, very, very good. And you know what I learned? That this has more to do with me than with my friend. Our ability to open up being vulnerable 
take the risk to share. And then actually being a good friend for somebody else. Do I care? If I care for the other, the other surely will care for me. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world, right? Can I be the friend that I would like to find in the world? And if you have only one friend that really matters, no doubt, uh, the risk of depression reduces, research shows. And then the fourth one I think is vitally important, and that's purpose. What is purpose for you? Yeah, what is purpose? Reason, yes? Yeah, uh huh, exactly. The reason to do something, yeah? Huh? But it keeps us going, right? Yeah. Ultimate goal, yeah. You know the why we talk leadership, I want to be a leader, but leadership for what? What makes me getting out of my bed? It can be what? Money, of course, position. That's a, a clear purpose. And there can be more than that even. Maybe I feel I adding value to the society, to the planet. And also that sense of I'm able to live my values and I'm connected to my spirituality. McKinsey has shown that if people feel that what they're doing is purposeful, they have five times a better well-being and show much more engagement. And that's an interesting one, actually, in this new uh, world after COVID. There's a little bit, I think, a shift happening in the world. Um, people want more purpose and more money. <laughs> so, huh? so, and then very important, these are interdependent, huh? interdependent. Yeah? Do you want to do an assessment for yourself? Okay, let's do that now. Next, I'm going forward. Um, so this is an assessment. Let's test whether this works. You could take out your, um, your mobile phone and then take this QR code and you can do an individual assessment. You have to press individual. You put in a little bit of bio data and then you will be asked a number of questions. Don't go to team, go to individual. You have mobile phone? Yeah? I don't, this is not to be good or bad. And you don't have to share your result. It's just for you as a reflection. Yeah? Is it working? OK. Go to individual. Right, you have team and individual. Go to individual, put in a couple of bio data. And then it, you will see your result. And be very honest. Nobody will see it. Be just very honest with yourself. Zero means not satisfied. And then 10 maximum satisfied in this particular point. And when you have done it, you will see something like that. And you can reflect on it. Uh, maybe you can think, what are you grateful for? What would you maybe like to develop? Which dimension would you like to develop? very nice huh? yeah yeah you can download it and you have an explanation of all the different dimensions and you can work with it how many of you are complete okay so my invitation would be that you have a four minutes discussion with the person next to you and you could share um, about two things when you look now at your results with which dimension would you say are you most satisfied? Maybe you realize I'm really gaining energy through that, right? And which dimension would you like to maybe develop? Yeah, more the physical, maybe the social, maybe purpose, um, maybe the mental, yeah? F four minutes, have a chat with your partner. But not about the last cricket result <laughs> or the Saturday night fever, what about this, okay? Four minutes, good. For how many of you, the highest satisfaction? Um, here, if you go back. For how many of you, the highest satisfaction was with the mental dimension? Highest, can you put up your arm? 
Okay. For how many of you the highest satisfaction was with physical? Oh, our sports stars. Good. For how many of you highest of so in social? Many of you are putting the hands up three times. <laughs> highest, only highest. One can be highest. Okay, very social campus. Very good. How many of you highest in purpose? Okay. Now lowest, how many of you have lowest in mental? Oh, very few. Lowest in physical? So many, yeah? Okay, how many of you lowest in social? Okay, how many on purpose? Oh, the lowest is the physical. Are we sitting too much? Yeah? Okay, let's stand up. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, there is a latest research. Are you, are you ready to do something co completely crazy with me? How many are, of you are ready for craziness? Wow, nice, yeah. I'm also always ready for craziness. You know, we are constantly on our screen, right? How many times are we blinking with the eyes? How many times are you blinking with your eyes? Every minute. How many times would you say? Eye blinking? Huh? 12 to 16 times. Latest research published one and a half years ago found when we are on the computer, our blinking rate goes down to six to eight times. Is this relevant? Yes. Because research has also shown in our Einstein moments, when we are really creative, we have a high level of blinking with the eyes. It's a fact. Now you're sitting on the screen because you want to have a creative idea, but your blinking with the eyes goes down and you're not coming up with a good idea. It's a problem, right? So what's the solution? Blinking moment eyes. Are you ready to do that? Okay, now can you blink at me? <laughs> it's Saturday, right? You're blinking a little bit. Okay, let's blink. Open, close. Open, close. Open. Close. Okay, turn to your partner and open close. <laughs> open close. <laughs> what have you learned with Christoph? Blinking into the eyes. Open close. Now faster, faster. 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 And now as fast as possible. Disco light. Can you do it? Faster. Okay, close your eyes. Feel for a moment. And open again. We'll do two rounds. Open. Open wide. Lubric lubrication is produced, right? Close. Open. Close. Open. Close. And continue. Do it intensely. Faster. Fast. Discotheque. <laughs> Maximum. And close your eyes and for a moment just be with yourself. Just relax. Observe the sensations in your mind. Take a long deep breath in and breathe out. Open your eyes. Creativity many a time is born out of stillness. Have you observed? We can sit down again. Thank you. I love it. Very, uh, you know my, in Telex, I'm the CEO. We have 200 trainers. And when we go to the big clients, you know, let's say we go to uh, the World Bank, 
typically my trainer tells to me, my co-trainer, Christoph, please don't make them stand up and do the eye blinking. I'm so, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Sometimes silly things are very important. Yeah, so now my, I wanted to share with you two more tips. And the first one is to train the presence muzzle. Have you heard about Mr. Maslow, the hierarchy of needs? Okay. Imagine Mr. Maslow would be still alive and he has to define the Maslow pyramid. What would he add maybe to this? Ah, very true, right? Today to be fine, see, if in Switzerland where I live, it's a beautiful view. Recently, I, a, a friend came to my house for the first time. I was very proud. I, I wanted to take the person to the balcony and tell him, look, this is Switzerland. <laughs> but this person was a very different mindset. She asked me, do you have Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> right? Then she had Wi-Fi and sat down and said, oh, very nice at your place. <laughs> huh? So this is a Wi-Fi tourism. Huh? We are wi fi -fing. So today, Mr. Maslow, different pyramid, right? Huh? So, what, you know, we are a living human experiment, actually, if you think of it. What does it do to us? Let me share with you. About 88 times in a working day, we are looking at our mobile phone. That's about, and, oh, Germ research in Germany is showing that the average German is spending 20 hours on the mobile phone. Half a working week. Every fourth minute we are looking at our phone. So let me, let me take you through a little bit of uh, Chimix here. Um, at the university they did a very interesting research which is relevant. There are two groups. Group number two had to switch off their mobile phones when they were working, group number one. So imagine you are working, your mobile phone is with you, but you're switching it off. Group number two, the mobile phone is next to, to them, but it is switched on. They are not receiving any messages, but subconsciously you know my mobile phone is on, right? When they do cognitive work, which group will perform better? How many of you say group number one performs better? Yeah. How many of you say group number two? Why group number two? What is your thinking? Ah, do you think it's possible to just focus on, on, on the work? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Ah. You know, Group number two performs 20% worse. How, wh wh why do you think that's the case? Huh? Yes. We are constantly anticipating something else happening. In a world with billion and billions of brilliant people, can we allow ourselves to perform 20% worse our true potential? To which group do we belong? How many of you belong to group number two? Let's be honest. Yeah. How many of us belong to group number one? Yeah. It's not easy to group belong to group number one, right? We have to be available. Many, the boss expects if I'm calling, where is Christoph? Not a good idea not to be available. So it's a dilemma. <coughs> At the University of London, they did something else. They were saying, well, information is key. So the best students of the campus, they were sent relevant information on their stu uh, uh, study topics. But they were almost bombarded with it. And you have a push message coming in every couple of minutes. So now they wanted to know, does that influence the intelligence quotient? if you're bombarded with information, relevant, how many would say it 
the IQ goes up, in, in intelligence quotient goes up when you have lots of information. How many would say it doesn't influence? How many of you says it goes down? Yeah, not sure? Yeah, look at this. It went down by 10 points. That's the effect of a sleepless night. How many of you have experienced the situation that you had a long working day, you're tired? You actually just want to free your mind, but then you're sitting on your bed or on your chair and you start scrolling in the social media. Even if you don't want to, you want to stop, but you cannot. How many of us had this experience? Oh, everybody, yeah. <laughs> You know, 40% of the Germans are saying, I'm addicted by my phone. I would say the other 60% don't know it. <laughs> you know, 50% of all the distractions that happen to us are self-induced. Have you had this experience? You're, you're sitting at your work, you're studying, you have to write, and finally you're really into it. And you need to finish. And suddenly, just from somewhere, an impulse comes and you start distracting yourself. You look at your phone, you look at the computer, and you wonder, yourself, what am I doing? This is not good. How many of you have experienced? It's a problem. It's a problem. And my prediction would be, and with the TLEX Institute we believe, those who are able to manage this in the future they will be more successful. Yeah? Very important. Because, you know, um, have you heard about dopamine? The dopamine, what is dopamine? Huh? Happy, yeah. Huh? It's a very happy one for the Swiss population. You know, it's a neurotransmitter which is produced, for example, when we do what? We eat chocolate. Very important for the Swiss industry, right? When we eat chocolate, dopamine is produced, we feel happy. Dopamine is also produced when we consume information. Actually, when you eat a chocolate, dopamine level goes up about 100%. And then it drops, so you need one more chocolate. If you get a relevant message and so many people like you on social media, almost also 90 to 100% it goes up and it goes down. So you continue scrolling. And you're hooked. And today the best minds in this world are right now sitting together at Apple, at Google and everywhere to assure that we get more and more addicted. So that's a problem, right? This dopamine addiction. And so ultimately, look at this. This is the attention span. This is a meta study on attention. In 2004, remember Facebook? came in, what, 2003, 2004. At that time, in average, a person was keep able to keep attention two and a half minutes at the computer. And this is a meta study over the last 20 years. Today we are at 44 seconds. And then the mind goes for a cappuccino. And then you have to take it back. So therefore, I think what you're doing here with meditation, breathing techniques, even sometimes you might feel, you know, it is a little bit, I don't know, tiring or boring or whatever. I think it's super important, managing our mind, being in the present moment. <laughs> because presence is like a muscle, you can train it. Yeah? How many of you want one more tip? It's okay? Yeah? Okay, I need a chai to give you a tip. Anybody has a question meanwhile? I have a question. Which, one, which was your most happiest moment which you had since you are on the campus here? Huh? 
Huh? Happiest moment? Huh? Do you remember it? <laughs> you don't want to say it? <laughs> huh? I can see your smiles coming. Happiness. You know, I think it is super important that we are aware that, yes, ha happiness, we can say, comes from outside. Something has happened in this moment and then it made you happy, no doubt. But we can cultivate optimism also. And we need to watch our language in that. And maybe I can tell you a story. So I, as a Christoph, I wanted, you know, when I grew up, I wanted to become a soccer player. In Switzerland, we are crazy about soccer. So uh, then I was quite good. I was in our uh, Swiss national team as a junior. So this is me when I was quite young. And my dream. <laughs> <laughs> the ball is bigger than me, right? So my dream was to be asked the best player in Germany, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. Switzerland didn't, didn't have any good players, so I wanted to be like the Germans. And then we were Swiss champion as a junior. And uh, then I wanted to be at least as strong and big as Miguel. This was Miguel, the strongest in the team. But you know who am I? I was like this at that age. I was the smallest. But then eventually I grew, I was 17 and I was close to a contract with, uh, with our team. I was really very good. Um, and then I, one day on the field I had an accident. Literally my vertebra kind of broke and I was taken to hospital. I could hardly walk for the next couple of months and they told me that's it, Christoph, finished. So I had to reinvent myself. That was one challenge, but the problem was for the next like four or five years, I had constant pain in my body. And I went to all doctors, I did physiotherapy. And I remember one day I sat with my dad when I was like 22, so many years later, and I said, I will not get older than 30 years, I'm really sure. No, there's no way. Because the pain, I cannot take it, it's like too much. And we went to see different doctors. So one day I came to a doctor who was more kind of a, he had a mental angle to it also. And I told him the same thing. I just cannot see myself living like that. And then he looked at me and he said, Christoph, I can feel your energy. I can feel how much you're investing. I pro promise you, when you are 30 years old, and when you will meet your friends from today, you will be at least as healthy and happy as they are. And I thought, well, what now, where is my back therapy? And then I walked out, and I will never forget, I walked out to the street, and I realized he treated not my body, but my mind. Because I had eternalized the problem. I told myself, this will stay like that forever. And if that is the case, our human system doesn't use its resilience. Language is a good indicator for that. I walked out saying to myself, I have pain right now. But the future is open. The miracles can happen. They can happen. And you know, I'm forever, uh, ever grateful to Mother India, to Gurudev. Um, the miracle happened actually just uh, three years later when I was for the first time in India. And uh, that was uh, 97. I was for the first time in Ashram. And uh, I, I did yoga and I, I had actually a healing experience at that time. And uh, uh, was suddenly the energy came back and uh, well, many things fall in place, but I was able to play soccer again then, and play tennis, and I'm very happy to be healthy now. But the starting point was 
that I started to treat my mind also. You know, I told myself, I will always have pain. Do you have sentences in your mind with always or never? I will be never as smart as my colleague. I cannot develop something like Steve Jobs, never. I will be always remaining single. Small word. Right now. We have to accept what is happening now. We cannot push it away. We have to accept. But keep it open. Do you see that? Keep your mind open. This is the one thing I've learned. I have pain right now. Cultivating optimism. Yeah? And then my last one is about gratefulness. It's great to be grateful. What is the balance of our life right now? Have we been on the lucky side or on the darker side? How many of us have experienced both? Pain and darkness? How many of us have experienced pain and darkness? How many of us have experienced joy and happiness and light? You know, there's an idea that the way we remember the past, this is how the future will sh show up. What? We remember the future. It's quite interesting. Have, you, have your studies been successful so far? You have some objective marks, but there is a subjective way you assess yourself. And what I've learned is that to be successful, we need self-confidence. But self-confidence comes with success. So where do you start? Where on earth do we start? I would say by being grateful. And, you know, simple exercise, if you want to do it, it's practical. Once in a week, write down all the things that you're grateful for, which worked well for you. They did a study, one group did that, just three to five things you're grateful for once a week. The other group wrote down five things they were struggling with. After eight weeks, the group which was wrote, writing down what they're grateful for were 25% higher in the happiness score. Who's this? The great Roger. I told you I want to finish with Roger. I was quite obsessed with him. And then it was such a pleasure. We were able to train the national tennis team in Switzerland. And I got invited. Actually, one of their uh, Wimbledon winners became our trainer. We have a Telex trainer who's a Wimbledon winner. Um, I want to ask you one thing to complete this, the last point. What do you think? Roger Federer, so for us who don't know Roger, one of the most successful sportsmen in the history, sports person. How many percent of all the points which Roger, Roger Federer played, points, just points at a time, did he lose? How many percent, how many, what is your guess? How many percent did he lose? A person who always won the game, how many percent of the points did he lose? What would you say? Huh? 10%, yeah? Huh? 11. Yes. Other guesses? Huh? 20? Anybody says more than 20? 47%. 47%. The man who won the most titles, almost, lost 40% 47, almost 50% of each point he played. What does that tell us? He so, uh, yeah, he bounced back. Very good. After five, sometimes they play for five hours. If you look the score, he will have maybe just two points more in total than the other guy. He's standing with the trophy. The other guy not. So if we're going to be just close to successful as Roger Federer in our career, and I'm sure you will, maybe we're going to also lose 47 times, 47% of the times. We're going to 
mess up a presentation, we're going to not get a job, we're going to be criticized, we're going to be accused, the media will say something about you, your friends. But maybe 53% you managed to win. And Roger calls this a growth mindset. Have you heard about that? Growth. Growing. The idea of a growth mindset is that you value development more than short-term success. What? I want to develop, not just to survive the next test. And this is the one thing I would wish for myself if I would have learned that earlier. For me in my school and studies, it was my next goal was my next exam. Somehow getting through. I wanted to win. Today I know that was not so important. It is important that we evolve and develop. And if that is our goal, we feel free in the moment of your exam. You will feel free. Because we cannot win if we are not ready to lose. It's impossible. We cannot be the best version if we are not ready to surrender. Doesn't make sense to you? Yeah? There's research which has shown that when children grow up, if the parents praise them for being good, they grow up less successful than when they are praised for trying. I'm ready to fail and get up. Well done, my son. You failed, but you got up. So if ever you fail, maybe you remember uh, this session and you will get up again. And there is a unique place in the world for you. We don't need to be the best. That's not, I not, don't think that can be the goal. But you, to reach your potential, the best version of yourself, that's beautiful. Right? And I wish you that. Yeah? All the best. Jane.